Hi, my name is John Novembre, and i um, happy to be uh, helping with this discussion of population descriptors and, and uh, legacy data. So my goal in this talk is to help prompt discussions regarding the use of legacy data and population descriptors in legacy data, um, and uh, have us think about um, uh, the upcoming discussion on decision trees for legacy data. I was uh, part of the NASM uh, working group on population descriptors and genomic data. It was a fantastic group to be part of with um, a wonderful set of, of scholars across many disciplines. So uh, I wanna thank that group for the, uh, the insights that were gained during that period. Um, the NASM report in terms of population descriptors considered several different categories of descriptors from ancestry broadly defined, genetic ancestry more specifically, geography, ethnicity, indigeneity, and race. And as an overview of the report and, and considering these descriptors and their use in genomics, we um, boil down to, to this, this uh, summary figure of many of the ideas that are in the report. So I, I kind of want to point you to it. And key aspects of it are the, the five major principles that guide all of the thinking, um, three major areas of requisites in terms of requisites for change in this area that, uh, that, are, that are sort of broad, avoiding typological thinking, measuring environmental factors, engaging communities and participants. And then the guidance for researchers was broken down into five major areas, depending on the application. And there were a number of comments about implementation that were, that were brought up. Notably, for many of those application areas, it was noted that it's enough to consider genetic similarity without invoking the idea of genetic ancestry or ancestry groups. And that's particularly helpful as ancestry groups are often labeled with terms borrowed from race, ethnicity, or language as descriptors. So I'm going to dwell on that a little bit because it's, uh, I think, essential for, for maybe thinking about what might be possible going forward, and um, but it also presents unique challenges with regards to legacy data. Um, for this point, I want to acknowledge and suggest this additional reading, this uh, review perspective piece by uh, Graham Coop that uh, is on archive, as well as this sort of digested uh, thoughts and deliberations of the committee that are in the report. So here's an example from genetic genome-wide association studies. In a simple standard GWAS, what we're trying to do is uh, associate and learn about uh, causal effects of SNPs on phenotypes. And uh, in doing that, we often implicitly assume that unmeasured trait affecting factors are uh, uncorrelated with the SNP genotype. But that is often you know, not the case. And um, because SNP genotypes, their frequencies uh, vary uh, across the world, and so does exposure to environmental factors, and so does a broad genetic background. So there's this uh, issue of, of dealing with hidden confounders and stratification. And um, one way to try to avoid these confounders is to try to measure them. And that would be uh, you know, including the relevant non-genetic environmental factors into your linear model for doing a genome-wide association study of phenotype on, on SNP. If you include those factors, then the, there is no hidden confounder, there's no stratification problem. So that goes back to the, that recommendation, the broad recommendation of measuring environmental factors. But uh, if you can't measure the environmental factors, then another approach is to try to make the group more homogenous in terms of um, controlling that background genetic variation. You might try to limit yourself to a, a, a more homogeneous genetic ancestry grouping. And so in practice, many people do this using uh, the self-described ethnicity of the individuals uh, or um, geography or uh, a summary of the genetic data, such as PCA, or some combination of the two, okay? And so the principal components, as one example, can be included in the linear model, you see with the red boxes there. Um, or another approach is to use uh, 
a, a, a random effect where you add a, um, a term in that has a pre-specified covariance structure. And that structure is uh, given typically by a genetic relatedness matrix. Okay. So um, with these approaches, you don't really require the genetic ancestry groups in the sense of uh, defining a uh, group based on a self-described ethnicity uh, or a sort of mashup of genetics and, and ethnicity. Um, it's enough just to use genetic similarity. So one can create a group of individuals where there's a high level of similarity amongst the individuals and, uh, and use that to form the grouping. Okay. Uh, that's in step two and step three, uh, um, uh, the, you know, neither of those use a, a notion of grouping as, as well. So, um, as an example of this, so one might be tempted to do a GWAS and say, well, I'm going to limit myself to just the white British and the ethnicity label, and that will help control for, um, you know, limit the, the genetic variation in the sample and uh, make for a cleaner GWAS. And uh, this is a, a from the UK Biobank showing all the individuals and highlighting on the left those 250,000 of them that have the white British and the ethnicity label. And you can see there's actually still some spread in PCA space. It might be preferable, actually, to say, let's take 250,000 individuals that are the closest to the centroid of the cohort. And that's an even more genetically homogeneous group. And by doing that, you have actually you know, improved upon your ability to control for um, uh, genetic stratification. Okay. So uh, that's an example of, of taking this recommendation and both improving the, the, the study and, and uh, stepping away from uh, using labels that can be confusing to the field. Uh, I should note that in UK Biobank, many of the GWASs that uh, are using, that say that they're UK Biobank, you know, there's, there's studies in the UK Biobank using the white British is actually a mashup of the white British ethnicity label and something like on the right side here of filtering by genetic similarity. And uh, the point here is that using genetic similarity alone is is uh, is often uh, you know sufficient because that's one of the key things being controlled for. Okay, so the NASM group then um, looked at different types of genomic study type, and in many of the cases uh, argued that genetic similarity should suffice for the actual operations of the study and the goals. Okay. And so that's a key takeaway um, that one should use population descriptors that match your purposes and that for many purposes, genetic similarity uh, is enough. Okay. To help navigate those choices, uh, a decision tree was produced and included as an appendix in the main document. It is also included as an interactive resource on the NASM website. So on the left here is what it looks like as part of the uh, appendix to the main document. And, um, and then I'm going to show an example of what it looks like in the, um, on the interactive NASM website. And I'm going to focus on um, what one sees for uh, looking at legacy data, which is our focus here today. So suppose you have what is the source of your data and you answer externally generated pre-existing data, uh, what we're discussing today, what legacy data. And um, and you answer is the data, then you're asked then, is the data individual or group level? And uh, if you answer individual, it will prompt you to review consents and community agreements provided by sources of the pre-existing data. And then while following these consent structures, use the available metadata, say the geographic origin metadata, ethnicity data, to form the population descriptors that you'll use. And uh, if necessary to create new labels, share and describe the formation of those new labels you created when you publish. Okay, so you might use the existing labels if they make sense for your study. If you create new ones, you would share and describe them and you would use the study purpose. What is the goal of your study to help guide you and whether you use the existing ones or create new ones, okay? 
So as an example, let's suppose you use dbGaP uh, to obtain individual level data from a pre-existing cohort. You review the consent structures of the original study and you find that it allows aggregation with other studies and relabeling of the, of the group labels. So then you can choose to say, use genetic similarity to your sample or some other reference and observe environmental covariance to identify individuals that, that are of interest to add to your discovery or prediction training set. And in this case then, perhaps then the only descriptor you'll need is to cite the cohort which you drew the samples from and then describe how you use genetic similarity to subselect the individuals that you wanted to include in your, in your uh, downstream uh, discovery or prediction training set. So you might say, uh, you know, we, we looked at, um, we clustered these individuals in, in PCA space and, uh, and um, chose individuals who were uh, close to the centroid of our, our, uh, our, our meta study of, um, of, of the merge set of the cohorts or something like that. Okay. Um, okay, so then now this is uh, supposing that you don't have individual level data, you get have uh, pre-existing data that's group level. Okay, you don't get to see the individual levels. Um, and then uh, there are two different cases here. So if you have group level data, and we're following the path on the left here, you would then be prompted to evaluate whether the existing group level descriptors will produce valid and trustworthy results or whether it will be misleading. And if the pre-existing level descriptors are not appropriate for your study, then you shouldn't proceed. And that's just sort of the limitations of of, of uh, you know doing responsible, trustworthy research. That if the pre-existing data, you know, if, with the descriptors used, are going to be misleading, then you probably shouldn't use that data. But suppose that they are, then uh, you can proceed with the analysis. This is now looking on the right side, and emphasize any limitations of the pre-existing descriptors in the communication of your results. If modifications to the group level data were made, you should share and describe the formation of the new labels when publishing. Okay, so let's consider uh, you have a variant of interest found in cell lines that you're studying, and you'd like to know if the variant is relevant to population prediction by assessing its frequency. Okay, so you say you have a, a, an interesting EQTL in the cell lines that you find. You want to know if it's, if it's um, predictive of the expression level of some important transcript in uh, some population that you're interested in, in doing a pragmatic uh, um uh, you know, work in, and you have access to legacy allele frequency data in continental groups like African, European, et cetera. Okay. So you then have to decide is a, an allele frequency, say in uh, African continental group, you know, specific enough for your purposes. And that's going to depend on, on context. Um, but, uh, um, we heard Charles Rutimi's talk earlier and, you know, describe the, the great variation that exists within African populations, uh, even European populations, what have you, we know that allele frequencies, uh, you know, vary, uh, within these continental groups. Um, and so you might have to be, uh, wary of doing this. So you might decide that it's, you know, uh, it's your judgment as to whether to include it or not. If you include it, though, you should be um, conveying in your publications what some of the limitations are of that choice, if there are substantial ones. Okay. So I think here, many of us would say that continental allele frequencies may be misleading. So if you use it, you should, you know, keep that in mind and make that clear to the, the readers of your, of your research outputs. Okay. So as a backdrop for the breakout groups, the discussions that, that can take place, uh, um, the, uh, it's important to keep in mind these different genomic study types and uh, to think about how legacy data might be used within each of these areas. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's useful and interesting to have breakout groups divided up by study type and to think about the different uh, challenges within each of these areas. What I've prepared next are some conversation starters. These are sort of you know provocative ideas or, or, or 
that might be a uh, spur conversation. So um, the uh, one of the um, aspects of the NASM reports recommendations is community engagement. So uh, this first conversation starter is about how can we be transparent about community engagement and original consent commitments? So many, most of you have probably been exposed to the Creative Commons licensing system. So this is a, a system by which web content is annotated by in a way that indicates what its downstream uses are approved for. So a Creative Commons license with the icon for the by, by, indicates that the item can be used as long as credit is given to the creator. With the NC icon, it means that only non-commercial uses are allowed. And the equals means that no derivatives or adaptations of the work are permitted. It needs to be, uh, if it is reproduced, it needs to be reproduced as is without modification. So this is a simple taxonomy, a sort of indication of, of uh, what uh, is permitted or not permitted in downstream use? And would this be helpful for legacy data sets? Would it be helpful to have a sort of set of icons like uh, and, and, and abbreviations like FL, meaning free labels, not required to maintain the labels as given to maintain consent? AGG, AG, meaning it's okay to aggregate with larger data sets. Maybe it's not, depending on the community's um, the consent that was established when the research was uh, um, study was first set up with uh, the community involved in the cohort. Um, H, okay for population history studies. We know in uh, many cases, human genetic um, samplings are carried out in ways where the study population is interested in um, genetic studies, but not uh, population history studies being carried out. So could these be uh, indicated in some simple way um, that downstream users would be able to quickly know what they are allowed to do or not do? Um, or could there be a central website that maintains a table for all the NIH funded cohort names with an identifier of yes or no on all these major questions and a pointer to a reference for reading about how the original population descriptors were described. So that reference would be you know, per cohort, like what is the place where you go to to understand the uh, community agreements and the uh, descriptors that were um, devised by the original um, group that uh, engaged in uh, working with the community upon which the cohort is based upon or um, uh, or just you know broadly the original researchers and their choices in in, in doing the uh, aggregation that they did when they uh, uh, um, agreed to have their data the data shared in dbgap let's say Okay, as a second um, conversation starter, how can we facilitate the merging of samples? So the report makes uh, all these recommendations about genetic similarity, but it didn't specify a metric nor suggest a threshold to use in terms of clumping samples together into analysis groups. Um, and while principal components are not perfect, you know, maybe one could define one or a few reference sets of PC axes to project samples onto for merging. So, you know, is it interesting to, to take one of the uh, major existing merges like the Human Genome Diversity Panel plus Simon's Genome Diversity Project Panel and uh, make it a standard for people to project onto that set of PCs and then um, uh, describe their samples kind of in terms of where samples land in that space? Uh, or are there drawbacks to that uh, because perhaps the those PCs are not fully representative enough? Um, so uh, the conversation is to discuss sort of the, the, the advantages and drawbacks of such approaches. Um, and, uh, you know, can we imagine a helpful software infrastructure that would help accomplish basic tasks? For example, you know, computing allele frequencies or LD patterns, legacy data after matching on genetic similarity to a query set. So rather than having a legacy data broken up by its um, legacy labels, um, could one uh, 
match one samples to the subset of the legacy data that is most similar to your test individuals? And um, would that be useful? Um, what about exploring metadata or labels in relationship to genetic similarity? Uh, um, so these are all tasks that maybe uh, the report suggests are interesting, but but software doesn't yet exist for them. And 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 uh, would it be it might be constructive for this group to be discussing what would be helpful software infrastructure in that space. Okay, another question would be how to future proof uh, active cohorts. So um, as we collect cohorts and they will in the future become legacy data in the sense that the original individuals in this cohort cannot be recontacted, uh, what can we collect and um, release as met metadata data that will um, make the existing studies easier to harmonize in the future? So um, the NASM report had this box five, two that had uh, some suggested common data elements to include as metadata, but this is really just a, a, a launching point uh, for, um, for uh, you know, this task. It wasn't a, a, a sort of regulation, this was sort of some ideas. So you can see the language and example of useful common data elements to include. Um, for example, so uh, what would this group like to see in terms of common data elements that would be helpful? So um, there's much work ahead, and I think that's important to emphasize. The NASM report was uh, a broad uh, structure for thinking about this problem. It was not a simple style guide. It was a, a reflection, really, and a call to arms on considering the rationale for the use of particular population descriptors in particular contexts. So it should help one think about how to make these choices. And uh, there's no one size that fits all. Um, but uh, there probably will be emerging best practices as people take into account these principles, these requisites. And, um, and it's going to be exciting to see how those develop. It's a call to take steps to avoid fostering typological thinking, including environmental context and engaging communities to improve our science and its impacts on society. And while some steps we can take are simple uh, in terms of moving ahead, in terms of uh, um, shifting our, our practices, that you know, there are many pragmatic challenges to the implementation that, that are ahead to solve. So hopefully the discussions that uh, are spurred by this um, uh, talk will um, help uh, um, in, in, in addressing those challenges. So I thank you and uh, onward now to any breakout groups. Thanks a lot.